The question that every tournament exists to answer is who was better at the game on that day that showed up? That's a question that has to underlie every single tournament. Otherwise, it's a much more casual, less competitive event. That's not a bad thing. You know, having a friendly game night with people where it doesn't matter who wins or loses is not an inherently bad thing, but it's not definitively a tournament. That is not something that you would say it is because the goal was not to figure out who was the best. So, first of all, before we can decide who is the best, we need to have a set of rules for a game where if two people from different places, from different cultures of the game or whatever, play against each other in that rule set, they will each agree that the winner was the better player. And so this is a large conversation that's going to happen over the internet among all of those people who are a part of that group. And all of the stakeholders are going to get involved and weigh in on how they think the game is best played. There might, in some cases, be some experimentation early on where different organizers will run the game in slightly different configurations just to make sure that, you know, this is the one that feels the best compared to this one. Um, but generally, everything is going to converge on one way of playing the game fairly quickly so that you can get organized competition that feels like it actually means something. Because if you're, say, playing Super Smash Brothers and one group of people is running items in all of their competitions, and that's what they're used to using, and then they have to play in an environment where items are banned, they're turned off, now they have to play the game in a fundamentally different way. There are strategies that they can use that won't work in the new place that they're trying to play in, and the people who they're playing against in that new environment are going to be more used to playing without the items than they are going to be used to playing with the items. And so that's going to create a fundamental disadvantage for the one group against the other on their home turf. If you want to be able to say that you're better than someone at the game, which is, you know, kind of a, a driving competitive motivator for a lot of people, you've got to have your rules set up the same way everywhere so that everyone agrees you're playing the def definitive version of the game. And that's the way you're going to be able to say, I am the best at Super Smash Brothers. <clears throat> now we need to set up a system where a bunch of people can, you know, come into a room or come to an event, um, whether that's online or in person, and they need to play each other in matches in such a way that you figure out through that tournament who is the strongest out of those players. Now, this can be done fairly easily with a small group of people, but the more people you add, the more complicated it gets. So let's talk about various solutions for how you can format those competitions and a little bit about their pros and cons. I might, you know, if people are liking these videos, I might go in more depth into all of these different methods, um, talking about things like tiebreakers and the math involved and, you know, so, some other more uh, nerd stuff, but I don't want to keep the video too long here. I just want to gloss over them so that people have a little bit more familiarity when they see these terms. So one of the best ways that you can determine who the best player is in a room of people is the round robin format. The round robin is really pretty airtight. If you win a round robin, there aren't going to be that many excuses. The way that works is you're going to get all the people that you have to play every single other one of them. So let's say you've got eight folks that have showed up. You're going to set them up in a grid that looks like this. So player one is going to play against players two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Nobody is going to be left out of your tournament schedule in a round robin. Every single member is going to have to play against you. Nobody gets to dodge you. It has a little screwy down there, but you'll just have to... Bear with me there. Player one can't play player one. Player two can't play player two. That's why I'm marking all of these off, because these are just the person versus themselves, which makes no sense to consider. But you might here say that player one beat every single person. And so by that metric, player one is the winner of the tournament. Now, obviously, this is not necessarily the way that it's going to break down. There are a lot of different possibilities here. Um, there are some situations in which, for example, let's say, you know, player five 
lost three matches, and won four. It's possible for multiple people to also be in that position. Um, and when that happens, you have to figure out ways to break ties, and different tournaments will break those ties in different ways. Some of them more mathematically, some of them just based on who won the head-to-head -head when two people tie. Um, but even then, rock, paper, scissors kinds of situations can occur where one player beat one, that player beat another, and that player beat the first one. And so then it gets a little bit complicated, and that can cause problems sometimes. But the main problem with a round-robin system is nothing to do with breaking ties. It's everything to do with just the practicality of getting everybody in the room to play everybody else. Because I'm, sure you can look at that and go, of course that's going to result in the be best, you know, results. That's going to get way more data than just about any other system you can come up with. Sure, you could do like a double round robin where you play everybody in the room twice, but it really just doesn't get any better than that for how much information you have on who can beat who and who loses to who. But if you scale that up above about eight players, it becomes prohibitively long. Like, imagine a room of a thousand people, and you're, you're at that tournament trying to figure out who is the best using a single round-robin grid. That means every individual player has to play 999 matches. If a match, say, of Smash Brothers takes 15 minutes, that is a number of minutes that you do not have in a single weekend. You cannot possibly determine what the, the the winner of that tournament is in a reasonable amount of time using that kind of a system. There, there are ways that round robin does get worked into large tournament formats, but we'll get to that in a second. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a system that does not have anywhere near that same problem, which is the single elimination bracket. I'll just shorten it to single elim for here. A single elimination bracket is something you're probably much more familiar with than a round robin. This is the NCAA March Madness tournament. Um, this is every you know tournament bracket that your your teacher has ever drawn up on the dry erase board. You get one person, one person. You have them play against each other. Winner advances. So the way that it's typically going to work is you have player one play against player four. Then you have player two play against player three. And the player that you write on the next branch is the one who won the match. So player one beat player four, player two beat player three, and now they advance to play against each other. And then you would declare the winner of that tournament to be player one, based on these results. That's how a single elimination bracket works. And this is much, much, much quicker than the other system. If you have a thousand people but you're putting them into a single elimination bracket. Now, instead of taking 999 rounds of competition, you're actually, let me do the math really quick. It's 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1028. That only takes you 10 rounds of competition to do what it took a round robin, 999 rounds of competition to find, which is this one winner. That's a lot better in terms of practicality. A single elimination tournament with a thousand people is something you can actually reasonably run in not just a single weekend, in a single day of competition. 10 rounds, 15 minutes each, that's just two and a half hours. That's nothing. In fact, it's so short that this is also something that you will almost never see because single elimination tournaments are also brutal. Imagine that you traveled to go, you know, out of town to a tournament and you lost round one and didn't get to play at all for the rest of the weekend. That's not worth your money. And people recognize that and so they generally won't run just a single elimination bracket. They might run some phase of the bracket as single elimination, but they're probably not going to run it that often. Two much more common systems that you're going to see, particularly in the Splatoon community. You've got one, which is just an improvement on the single elimination bracket, which is double elimination. Um, and this is a very popular system in the Super Smash Brothers community as well. 
So, same exact thing will happen in a double elimination bracket as a single elimination bracket. All of this stuff that we had before is going to happen exactly the way that it did. All right, come on up, cat. You want to come sit in my lap while I talk about tournament formats? Huh? Come on, get up here. Either get up here or stop whining about it. He's thinking about it. Come on. There he is. There's the boy. All of this is going to happen in a single elimination bracket and a double elimination bracket. The difference is that in a double elimination bracket, there's more. Player four over here isn't just out. They get dropped to another match against, in this case, player three, who also got dropped. And now... From there, they're going to play a match against each other. Let's say player three wins that. At that point, player four is out. See, the difference here is that instead of needing just one match lost in order to be eliminated, you need two matches that you lose to be eliminated. So you always have a second chance as long as you've only lost one time. And so after this match here, player one versus player two, player two loses and they drop to play against player three. And now if player three loses, they're out. And from here, player two has only lost once so far, so they get another chance to play against player one. Let's say player two wins this match. Now, the problem with this, declaring player two the winner, is that player one has only lost one match so far. So if this were to happen, player one would actually get a second chance to potentially come out on top. But if player one wins, player two has now lost two times, and so now they are eliminated. So in a double elimination bracket, uh, you will see these rounds uh, labeled in a certain way. Uh, this match here, this match at the very end between player one and player two, is called Grand Finals. And if player one wins set one of Grand Finals, then they win the tournament, but there can be a set two of Grand Finals. If player two were to win the first round, and then player one were to get their second chance. So this is set one Grand Finals, and this is set two Grand Finals. And remember, set two might not happen. It depends on who wins this match right here. So that's how double elimination works. It's a little bit more complicated, but it is significantly more fair. And something that I want to point out here that we haven't talked about much yet. Take a look at how this bracket ended up. We have player one in first place, player two definitively in second place. Player 3 definitively in 3rd place, and Player 4 definitively in 4th place. When we just had a single elimination bracket like this, between Player 3 and Player 4, who was 3rd and who was 4th? Both of them lost Round 1, neither of them have played against each other, it's just completely unclear how those results work out. So, double elimination, because we have these extra matches, also allow us to resolve some of these ties. Now, a lot of the time with just four players, what you would do is actually just run a, a single elimination bracket, but have a third place match where you have player three play against player four right here, and then you're able to determine that placement, and that's all you really need to do. But if it gets any bigger than a four player tournament, it's going to take a double elimination bracket to be able to determine who the winners of that were, um, and to give those, extra pl those other players extra matches. Um, so for a four player tournament, I would just run a single elimination bracket with a third place match, but it, it will generally be better most of the time to run a double elimination bracket to get those extra placements. So that's one really solid option. And there are plenty of tournaments that are going to run with that format. 
One other one that's a little bit more complicated that we can talk about is called the Swiss format. The Swiss format is more similar to round robin, but it solves some of the problems of round robin by not having you play against everyone, just having you play against enough people to figure out where you should be placed. So the Swiss format is based a lot more on math. Uh, what you're going to do in a Swiss format is you're going to take the eight players and you're going to place them according to their seating. We'll talk about seating again in another video here. So this is the order in which you expect the players to place. And what you'll do is you'll play player one versus player five, player two versus player six, three versus seven, and four versus eight. After these matches play out, you're going to start setting people up in matches based on their record, their win-loss record. So if player one beats player five here, they have a 1-0 record, and player five has an 0-1 record. You're going to sort everybody into, these are the people with the 1-0 records, let's say that's 1, 2, 3, and 4. And everyone who has the 0-1 records, that's going to be 5, 6, 7, and 8. And now we do the same thing. We have player 1 versus player 3. We have player 2 versus player 4. These are all of the matchups that are currently 1-0. and And then for someone who's 0-1, you're going to have 5v7 and 6v8. And... The math is going to get a lot more complicated after this round. It only didn't get complicated in this round because we have an even number of players that breaks down into a power of two. But effectively, all that's happening is you're ranking, you're setting people up in their matches based on what the win-loss record is that they have. And as time goes on, the players are going to sort themselves more and more. And just like in a single elimination bracket, as time goes on, you're going to be able to say that one player is definitely the winner um, because one player is going to be left with the highest win-loss record out of anybody. Um, there's a point in the, the tournament, you know, based on powers of two, at which you're going to be able to guarantee that only one player is going to have that kind of a win, the, the highest win-loss record. Um, and from there, even if there are ties, there's a lot of math built into the Swiss format system that will allow you to break those ties based on things like how difficult were the players that you ended up playing against. Um, because, you know, the players that you beat that were uh, of a higher level, let's say that there's a tie between player three and player four, player four's win against player two isn't going to count for quite as much as player three's win against player one. So there are a bunch of little things like that that could be used to break ties. But the basic idea here is that everyone's playing someone based on the win-loss record, and they'll play until you've got enough data figured out that you can mathematically declare a winner. One challenge of the Swiss system is that in order to set all of these matches up, you need to have the results of every single match before you can create the next round. And that can pose a problem in some communities. Um, so you need to have every single one of these results before you can sort them. If you're missing players four and player eight because player eight hasn't shown up and nobody told the TO about it, now everybody is waiting because that match didn't get played. There's another problem if you're trying to play this in an in-person kind of setting where resources to play matches are limited because if you only have two setups in order to play these, then this match between one and five and this match between two and six can happen, but three and seven and four and eight are waiting on that match before they can play theirs. And then once one and five and two and six are done, they have to wait for three and seven and four and eight before they have another match. And so that doubles the length of the tournament if you only have half the setups that you need. That can get prohibitively bad in something like a major Smash tournament, where you have thousands of people and there are just only so many TVs that you can fit into that venue. It gets even worse in a situation like an in-person LAN for a team game, like you'd say, let's say you've got a, a five player team in Valorant and you need five gaming PCs just for one team to be able to compete. 
And you need five more gaming PCs to have even one match. Well, if you want to play four of those matches at once, now we're talking about 40 high-end gaming PCs in order to be able to... Now we're talking about 40 high-quality gaming PCs to be able to play that match. And you can see how, cost-wise, that can start to become prohibitive pretty quickly. Um, so Swiss is definitely best suited to online events. It can work in some in-person settings. For example, something like chess or smash, where one setup plays two people, and those setups aren't necessarily the most expensive thing. That can work out. You know, smash... They're, they're, they don't need fancy TVs. In fact, for the Melee scene, they're going to prefer CRTs a lot of the time, which are so cheap that people are getting rid of them for free. So that can sometimes be doable, um, but it is a limitation that's really important to think about with the Swiss system. So single elim, we'll just abbreviate as single elimination, is going to be fast, faster than any of the other options, but volatile. And that's, that volatility isn't necessarily a bad thing. This is part of why March Madness, madness, is so exciting. That the loser is always going to just go home. Now, that also means it's going to be brutal. And if you're in an improvement-focused kind of uh, group here, where you haven't been spending, you know, an entire season prepping up until this point with, you know, high-level coaches and, every, and everything, it can be not worth your time to try and compete in the first place if you're just going to get eliminated that quickly. But that can definitely be an option, and it's also something you can layer into a tournament really well. Double elimination is also fast, less volatile, but still fairly volatile, and gives more placements. Round Robin is best for data. If you're looking to figure out who the actual best in the room is this is the absolute best most accurate way to do it but very slow and then swiss is going to be fairly quick and pretty accurate but is set up and game dependent and it also requires that you have some system in place usually computerized to actually be able to calculate things. This is something that you really could not just try and draw up on a dry erase board in a dorm room. Um, a Swiss system, you really do kind of want to have a computer, uh, unless you're a mathematician yourself, to be able to do those calculations. And even if you are a mathematician, don't waste the time in between the matches with trying to scribble out each individual person's, you know, coefficients. Just, just plug it into a computer. Just figure it out that way. What you'll typically see in tournaments is a combination of these different formats. You're usually not going to see, unless it's a relatively small tournament, you're usually not going to see just one of these things being chosen. Um, you will often see at a Smash tournament, for example, a round robin pool that leads into a double elimination bracket, where the round robin pool will make it so that, say, the top two people out of each pool get to go on into the double elimination tournament. And then in that double elimination bracket, um, you actually decide who the winner is. In a Splatoon event, you're very likely to see Swiss for the preliminary rounds um, because that's an online game and so you don't have to worry about setups at all. And so it works really well for us. We can run Swiss for five or six rounds and then whoever has the, a certain record, you know, um, the top three, you know, top like 16 people by their score in the Swiss bracket, they get cut there and they get put into the top bracket. And then that top bracket is run in double elimination or sometimes single elimination formats. Usually you're going to see more data accurate formats, the rounds that, you know, take longer to finish. Those are going to be used early on to eliminate players. Um, and this way, you're giving everyone a good, a good number of matches, but you're also in that process narrowing down so that you can get to this faster, more exciting format for the finish. And then you'll typically see a, an elimination format at the end because once you get to the elimination stage, now it's more exciting. Um, now it's, ooh, loser might go home or drop to the loser's bracket. There are stakes here. You know, losing this match means more than... Um, you know, losing an extra point on, on your Buchholz coefficient, which is something that you would use to calculate your Swiss score. Um, that doesn't mean anything to anybody. 
losing and going home does. And so you want to make the, the final matches the ones that are the most climactic because that's what puts on the best show. Um, and that's what everyone was really interested in finding out in the first place, right? Remember, we came here to figure out who the best team or player in that tournament is. And so typically you want that little bit of extra volatility right at the end just to make it a little bit more exciting. Because um, at this point, you know, they've all earned their right to be there. And now it's just who's going to take it on that day. Hopefully you found that somewhat interesting or that helps explain something that uh, you've been seeing in tournaments and have been confused by. Um, hopefully this will help you follow tournament brackets if you've been interested in, in watching it but you don't really know how it's working. Hopefully this will help you if you're new to competitive and you're trying to figure out how things are going to work on the day of a tournament. Uh, if you liked it, please let me know and uh, I'd be happy to go into each of these systems in a little bit more depth. Um, I'd also be happy to do a video on seeding. Uh, which is a system by which uh, you decide what the order is of those matches. For example, with Swiss, why was it the player one played against player five? Why was it the player two played against player six? That's based on seeding, and that's something that, uh, you know, this is already a pretty long video. We'd want to talk about that in a separate one if there were interest. So let me know, and... Uh, have fun going and gaming and, and being the best that ever was.